I just want to motivate it a little bit by saying that twisting is a natural operation, so of course you should care. Um, but I mean, really, really it is. So you think it's about classical modular forms, and you look at their Fourier expansion. If I have a character, and I'm going to be restricting myself to quadratic characters here for reasons I'll talk about later, but if you have a character of a, conduct of a conductor C, if the modular form is level N, <coughs> Take the character right in front of my Fourier coefficients, and that's also the Fourier expansion of a modular form. It's, uh, it's a level m, where m is going to be the least common multiple of n and the square of the conductor. So it turns out that this is actually a completely local operation. Okay, this twisting is, is something that's local. So what do I mean by that? So we're going to look a little bit. This slide is just the usual yoga of going between um, you know, classical modular forms and automorphic forms or automorphic representations. So instead of having a function that transforms almost invariant under my modular group, I'm going to define now a function that's invariant, right? So under action by, in this case, gamma of n. And the space of all functions of this type, if I look at the span inside of this infinity of case of R, then it's going to be finite dimensional. So I don't want to spend too much time thinking about that. And using parabolic subgroups, we can define classical automorphic forms. Um, and we want to think about them modality. So we're almost getting to local. I don't want to dwell too much on all of this. We can go spend a lot of time explaining how all of it works. But when we get an adelic formulation, or this is our uh, subgroup of level n. And so then to construct an automorphic representation, we just look at the space of all these automorphic forms that are square integral. And it's our group G acts on that space by right translation. And our space of plus forms is going to decompose under this action into irreducible representations. And these are our classical automorphic representations of G. So here's the important part is that this classical automorphic representation is a tensor product of a bunch of local representations. And each of these, uh, here I'm talking over QP, a representation of G over QP. And so we can think then this automorphic representation, this is a modular form, F, and I construct that automorphic form, can look at an associated automorphic representation to F, right? the group just acting on that particular automorphic form. So this local representation is completely determined by the action of our HECA operators and the weight of the modular form. Okay. So we're going to do everything locally. And we also have locally that if I have a nice representation, so this wall, et cetera, then there's some n for which um, the space of vectors invariant under gamma naught of p to the n is non zero. So there is some n. So I think I mean generic in this case. And if n pi is the least such integer, I'm going to call that the conductor of my representation. And this is really important here. The dimension of b of n pi is 1, OK? So the smallest integer, the smallest, you know, if I'm looking at things that invariant under gamma naught of p to the n, right? It, maybe there's nothing that's invariant under gamma naught of p. Right? Maybe there's nothing that's invariant under gamma naught of p squared. Maybe things are finally invariant under gamma naught of p cubed. And if there is something invariant under gamma naught of p cubed, then it's only one dimensional. That's always going to be the case. So, Every element then, this is even more. So I get this one dimensional space, and then every other element of my representation is obtained by applying level raising operators and taking linear combinations. So, so really, there's only one thing in some sense. Right? There's just this one dimensional space, and I build everything else from it. My representation is really this one dimensional space. This guy is my new form. Okay? A generator of that one dimensional space is a local new form. Okay, so this is a really powerful theorem because basically it says I can take these level raising operators and a single vector in my space and I get 
everything. And then I can compute everything else. Okay. So let's talk about twisting in the GL2 case. I said it was going to be local. And this is all, you know, if I tried to find the theorem I'm going to write about GL2 in a book, I probably couldn't. But it's not really new either. It's one of those kind of well known, if you think about how you want to write it down, it's pretty easy to write down kind of things. So instead of just over QP, I'm going to make it a little more general. We're going to let F be any non Archimedean local field with characters to zero. Um, with uh, ring of integers O, maximum ideal P, and uh, uniformizer chi. And chi is quadratic, I shouldn't have put anything written there, character of F cross, and it's going to have a conductor A of chi. And so notice that if the residue characteristic is odd, there's actually only one possibility for chi, right? It's going to have conductor 1. Okay, and n is always going to be a non negative integer. All right, so I can define this twist, this L should be here, I'll go to that. Uh, define a twist here, just basically what I'm doing is I've got a vector v that's already invariant under gamma log p to the n, and I'm hitting it with a matrix here that is making it not invariant anymore. Because right? if I just integrate over the group with like chi, I'm going to get zero, right? because it's going to be invariant all the time. So this is always the trick here to try to get something that's not zero. Um, so I make it not zero by shifting my vector into something that's no, no longer going to be modular and then integrating and getting something back to the modular. Okay. And in fact, this is a twisted representation of level M where M is the maximum of N, which is the original level of our, um, mod of our vector, and twice the conductor. Okay. So, Notice one thing here is that if I have a ramified enough representation, then the twist doesn't change the level. Okay, or it doesn't change the conduct. So level, maybe it's level. Um, and because I'm working locally a lot, n here really means p to the n. So that's something different for the paramodular situation. And to me, that's one of the things. So, so this is giving me the representation of that twisted modular form that I showed you at the beginning, right? So we had the regular modular form with the usual Fourier coefficients, and we put pi's in front of the Fourier coefficients, we got another modular form. If I start with the new form here, I can actually prove that the twist of this is going to be a uh, one-dimensional space, and it's going to give me that um, Fourier coefficients that are just twisted by pi. So here we go. Let pi b be a smooth representation of GL2f, the trivial central character. Um, and n is going to be the maximum of n into raised pi. If I've got a vector in the representation of level n, then the twist of that vector is going to live in the twisted representation. So if I act on it by something in gamma naught of q to the n, then I'm going to get at the twist of it by the determinant of k, and then get back to the twisting Okay, so further, if pi is generic, so that means I have a Whittaker model, which means I can compute zeta functions, right? And if I can compute a zeta function, I can show that the zeta function is not zero. So this is the reason for thinking about generic. If pi is generic, irreducible and admissible, and if the level of the representation is, uh, if n, right, so if I'm looking at v, it'd be of n, n has to be bigger than n pi, otherwise there's no v's in there. Thing, then the image of this twist is going to be spanned by the non-zero vector t pi of beta prime of n minus n pi, w pi. So w pi then is going to be the new form for v, and the w is because it's living in the Whitaker model. Right? So this is going to be it's generic. And beta prime is actually an identity map when we're talking about GL2. It's a level raising operator, but it's just the one that says, okay, I'm including all the old forms in the next level. Right? Because I can do that. Okay, so and importantly, this is going to be, so it's spanned by that non-zero vector, so it's a one-dimensional space. So if I start with a one-dimensional space, the image of this is a one-dimensional space. So this is me saying this is really the right map. I mean, I can't prove that it's canonical because I, I don't really know what conditions I would want to state. 
to say, okay, this is the, the canonical map that does these things. But I think saying that it, you know, it behaves the way I want it to, it, it maps a vector in the regular representation to a vector in the twisted representation, and the image is one dimensional, so there's no other way I could get that space. Then that's a pretty, pretty strong argument. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about GSP4. So if I let J be this matrix here, then I can define the outbreaker GSP4 to be the set of all um, four by four matrices, yeah, vertical four by four matrices, where they transform, they almost preserve J, right? They preserve J up to a similarity factor for some lambda in GL1. Okay. Then GSP4 acts on the Ziegel upper half plane. Right, just the way that you know, GL, uh, SL2R acts on the uh, usual upper half plane, it's going to act by Mobius transformations. Um, I don't get to write quotients anymore because they're matrices, so I have to write inverses. Um, but, but everything else is the same. Just make all your letters capital. <laughs> Try not to forget that there's two by two matrices in there and commute for multiplication. And yeah, so this goes back to Ziegel, clearly. This stuff has is, is, been around for a long time. And these Ziegel modular forms that are holomorphic functions um, on H2 that you know, transform with not just a factor of autopathy, but also a similitude factor under the action of G. Now these, the way I've defined it here, um, right, because I've got G and SP4Z, these are Ziegel modular forms of paramodular level one. Okay, I haven't defined the paramodular group yet, but I will. So these are also of level one for the Ziegel congruent subgroup. So here's a sort of important point. When you start getting away from just GL2, all of these notions of, well, there's a lot of ideas that are one idea in GL2 that are like two or three or four ideas in GS2. And this is one of them, right? There's not just one type of congruent subgroups. Okay, you have, here you have both the Ziegel congruent subgroups and the Klingon congruent subgroups. And what I'm going to be talking about is the paramodular group, which is not even a congruent subgroup at all. Okay, it's built out of the Klingon. Okay, so we're going to focus on these paramodular groups, and I want to, I'm spending a fair bit of time talking about that because I want you to believe that they're important. I mean, why would I care about these things in the first place? Um, and to do a little bit of a sales pitch for somebody else's conjecture, which I think is sort of cool. So, so what's the paramodular group? So it's this subgroup, right, of SP4Q, but it's not in SP4Z. That's part of the reason it's not a congruent subgroup. And it should look a little bit like the Klingon congruent subgroup if you are familiar with the Klingon, but it's got this thing right here. <coughs> that's, that's the tricky part. It's got some denominators. And those denominators mean, in fact, that if I look at the paramodular group of level n, it's not going to be contained in the paramodular group of level n times p. Right? So you don't have that nested So then a paramodular form is a holomorphic form in exactly the same way on, on the upper half plane uh, that transforms just as you would expect it to transform, right? Under this action of the paramodular group. So then, and again, we can do the same yoga if I have a cuspidal irreducible admissible representation of GSP4 the adult, which is invariant under the paramodular group, I can construct it a Ziegel modular form. Uh, so this is the yoga in the opposite direction, right? So I'm given a representation of GSP4A and variant under the paramodular group. I get a Ziegel modular form, and, and this is always the way you do it, right? You pick some, some group element that takes the point I, or the matrix I here, to, um, you know, to your Z that you're interested in. And, and because your functions before were on the group, <coughs> now you have functions on the point. So there's a theorem of um, Ross Roberts, who's my collaborator on this work, and Ralph Schmidt, who's at Oklahoma, is that if I have a nice representation of, and I should say GSP4, terrible. Uh, so let's just say GSP4F for a local field, then there's some N for which the space of is invariant under the paramodular group of P to the N, 
is non-zero. So exact, this is exactly the same theorem as we have for GL2. Exactly, exactly the same. So moreover, if n pi is the least such integer, then the dimension of that first space is 1. So I have new forms. And, and every element of V can be obtained by applying level raising operators and equal linear combinations. Okay, so I have more level raising operators now. In, in the case of GL2, there's essentially one um, there's identity and then, and then another one is sort of multiplication by, or getting it by P inverse, basically. Um, here I have three level raising operators because I have you know, more space in my matrix. I can do more stuff, basically, right? Four by four matrices, there's more choices, which is something we're going to see in a minute. But this is why we care about paramodular forms, right? Because now we have this powerful theory of new forms, which allows us to fully understand these representations. Um, so, the paramodular conjecture of Rumer and Kramer is that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between isogeny classes of abelian surfaces over Q with conductor N and trivial endomorphism ring and weight two new forms F on, that's the same as my field. Well, that's a new form, that's one field, that capital F, on the paramodular group of level N with rational eigenvalues, not in the span of this, not, not of this particular trivial type, such that their L functions coincide. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these guys. And the aladic representations associated to F should be isomorphic to those in the T module A for any L front end. So it's a very precise conjecture. It's testable, which says that I find some, I mean, it, it's not just that every abelian surface should be um, paramodular, it's also that every paramodular form should have an abelian surface. Right, so, so given a paramodular form, you should be able to find one. Um, and it's, it's pretty compelling. I mean, it also sort of begs the question, what about the other abelian surfaces? What about those with real multiplication? What about those, you know, so what are the right paramodular, or what are the right modularity theorems to be looking for for those cases, right? So this is somehow saying paramodular group and the paramodular forms are our surfaces with the more. So this, this is actually one of our motivations for studying these twists is because I was at a conference and Brewer said, Hey, so I've been trying to figure out what the Fourier coefficient should be for um, twists of paramodular forms, you know, because it's a, it's a nice way to generate more examples, right, to take twists. And um, he said, can you guys figure that out? And we're like, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. And that was two years ago. Um, but we have, I mean, we have a local operation, and we have a formula for Fourier coefficients um, that we've computed, but I'm sort of hoping that when we go to rewrite it up in the paper that it'll be even simpler, because it's not, it doesn't fit on one slide. That's uh, maybe on one page in a paper. So it's not clear at this point how to simplify it. And I'll maybe say something about that at the end. But this is a this is a nice conjecture. I would encourage you guys to, to if, if you're interested in modularity type things, this is something we're thinking about. Um, okay, so now that we're going to start talking about twist of GSP four or a pair of forms. So it's still F is a non-Archimedean local field, and pi D is a smooth representation of GSP four F for which the center acts trivially. This cent trivial central character is essential for the paramodular um, forms and, and for the new form theory and all that. And we use it. I mean, so the fact that we have to have trivial central character means that the only twists that we consider are quadratic twists. Because right, if I twist by a character that's not quadratic, then I'm not going to have trivial central character anymore. So, pi is going to be a character of f cross that's quadratic, and kn is now going to be uh, the paramodular group of p to the n. And vn is going to be this space of vectors which are invariant other kn. And now we also have a twisted representation. There's different ways to consider this. Um, so here, V and pi is going to be the space of vectors that transform according to pi for k and kn, and that should be a lambda of k instead of a dec k. Um, you can also take the same, so this is a subspace of V. You can also think of the twisted representation as taking V and actually tensoring every function of pi. 
Okay, it's a take a function and then you spit out a new function that's chi times the original function. Um, that's usually, if people think of twisting representation, that's usually what people write down when they write down p tensor time. That's what they're thinking of. Um, they're isomorphic. It's really easy to see that the, we do the same thing. So. All right, so we're redefining GSP 4 f now using this J because it makes things prettier. In particular, if you go back to um, the definition of pair modular group, which I'm going to indulge myself in you because I want to, what happens when we redefine J is that these two columns interchange, and these two rows interchange. So you get your little in inverse right down here, right up here in the corner, and then your, your uh, NZs are just a little L shape, and everything's really pretty to look at, so, so we like the new shape. It's just not traditional. Deagle used the first J, so whenever I talk about global stuff, I always you know, show respect to Deagle, but I, I really like the reverse diagonal. These guys, I mean, they're, they're the same, right? You just conjugate by that matrix K there on the right and go in between the two forms of the group. Okay. So the naive generalization of what we just did, right, that first T chi, would just be, well, okay, let's stick a pi to the minus something up here and shift our vector away, and we should be fine. And you're not. It actually still turns out to be zero. I mean, it's not as obvious. You have to do a little bit of computation. But, but it's actually just algebraically zero already. And so the question is, what do you do? How do you find a twist that's not zero? I mean, you can, there's, there's, lots of, there's lots of places I could put entries in a four by four matrix, right? There's a lot of choices in GSP4. We're trying to alter that vector and get it something that's not zero. So um, this <coughs> next part is actually not in the paper, but I think it's interesting because I think it's sometimes interesting to know where things come from, even if you don't need them for the proof, right? So there's a subgroup, um, P3 of GL3F, which sits inside of GSP4, and it's elements like this. So where there's stars, it can be anything, and where there's nothing, it's zero, okay? So it, it's just a subgroup of this shape, and it's a quotient of the Klingon parabolic. So that's the Klingon parabolic subgroup of GSP4, and P3 is, is going to be a quotient of that. So the idea was that if I can find a non-zero twisted element in a P3 representation, then I should be able to lift that to a non-zero Klingon twist. And then if I get a non-zero twist of the, that's invariant under the Klingon, then I can integrate that up to the whole paramodular group and get a non-zero twist. Um, so that's what we did. And we tried. Um, so I've got a smooth representation of P3, and I've got something that's invariant under P3 intersect GL3O. We're not talking, we can't talk about automorphy here. We don't get that for P3. P3 is not as nice of a, of a group in that way. <coughs> but, but we can still conduct, conduct, construct a twist. And this looks sort of funny, but maybe you see some of what's going on. We've got, um, you know, we're essentially trying to move things away from, uh, from invariance. And we tried a lot of different things that were zero, and this one wasn't. So that's, that's what I'm going to say about why this one. Because it, it, it's not zero, and it gives the right results. And there's been a lot of times in the proof where it was just good enough. So I feel like it's really correct. When you have just exactly everything you need in all the ways, then you feel like you've done something well. So, so that twist then is going to be invariant under K and P3, but it's not quite as good as we want, right? It's only invariant for stuff in P squared right there, so we need to integrate it one more time. And we do that. Just integrate over all of P3. And we get something that's not trivially zero. We don't also have a beta function here or either, so we can't and verify completely that it's actually not zero, but when we do the Klingon one, we'll see that the zeta function is not zero. Um, so this gives us a good candidate for our analysis. Okay, so now we're gonna lift this to GSP4. And there's only one way to do it. Okay, so that's what we do. Um, and we get uh, twisted vector V chi. So in V chi there is actually behaves, you know, with the right behavior with 
respect to the pi that we were looking for. And it's this is all for k in the subgroup of g is before s, where again we have rules well, that we don't like here. Two a of pi, and then we get um, p to the minus two a of pi there. Which is fine. I mean that's more than we need. We're playing it anyway. So it's a little better than Klingon already, right? And you can see that that came up really naturally when I lifted the GSP4, that those denominators up there, it just sort of have to be there. It's not, I mean, uh, the paramod, the word paramodular was actually invented by Siegel. Siegel studied the paramodular group. It's not a, it's not a new group. It's just that um, in trying to develop the theory of nameforms, Brooks and Ralph saw that you couldn't do that for the Klingon sub paramodular subgroup. You couldn't do that for the Siegel paramodular subgroup. You had to use this group that, um, at some point, they realized that they were using something that someone had seen before. Okay. So, and B chi is also in very under this subgroup. So, GSP4. This is looking a lot like the Klingon, but this is, we get better invariants here than we would normally need for the Klingon of level n. And we use that. Like we need that, actually, to be able to, to prove that this is the right thing. So, that's sort of cool to see. All right, so here n is the maximum of n plus 2a of pi and 4a of pi. And this is one of the things I said at the beginning. No matter how ramified my representation is, if I twist it, I'm always going to get more <coughs> with this twisting operator. And, well, I'll, I'll say something more about that at the end. So then I make it clean in by um, you know, looking at the methods of the clean in, so integrating up to get Klingon invariance. And now, at this point, I can actually prove that this thing is not, in general, zero. So I can prove that if it's generic, um, you know, the zeta function is going to be gone here again. I didn't write down the zeta function computations. I didn't use um, Then, finally, we're going to make it um, paramodular. So to do that, we actually use one of the level raising operators. So I, you know, I talked about there are several level raising, level raising operators, and this is the one that's basically the identity. This is the trivial one in some sense. So it's, it, but it's the level raising operator back to the level that I'm interested in. So I'm not increasing the level anymore. This is going to level n, but these look a lot like what we tried to do at the beginning, right? When we got zero. But but now it it doesn't give us zero. But we also have this operator here, t n which is a sort of special element of the paramodular group and a really hairy one when you try to deal with Fourier coefficients. <coughs> so, and we get our main theorem, which says if pi v is a smooth representation of GSP4F with trivial central character, and n is the maximum of n plus 2a of pi and 4a of pi, then if I have a vector of level n, I can twist it, and that twisted vector is going to um, transform according to chi for anything in the paramodular group of level p to the big n. So what's more is that if chi is generic, irreducible, admissible, and you know, n is bigger than n pi, so that there's vectors that are in there, then the image of t chi is going to be spanned by this non-zero vector. Where um, this is the new form of level n to pi, and this is our level raising operator. So I was pretty excited that the theorem came out to be pretty much exactly the same as the GLC. I mean, we wrote it to be exactly the same. <laughs> it was still, I, I didn't expect to get a one dimensional image. So, what about the Fourier coefficients? Well, let me just say something here. So, actually, I want to go back quite a bit. When we go back to look at the behavior of Essentially, going to slash it by that twisting operator with all of those 
the G is going to be that linear combination of all of those matrices that I have, right? All of those operators that I have on there. And so that means I'm going to be hitting G by Z here, right? And if you think about what that means in the Fourier expansion, that that means that if C, that matrix that's on there in the corner, is not zero, then I'm going to get some Z inverses, right, in my formula. That's bad. Z inverses is not going to give me transformation on Fourier coefficients. I don't want Z inverses, right? I want to hit this with an operator, and I want to be able to pull back out everything else, and I want all of the action to be hitting on the Fourier coefficients, right? That's where I want to see the behavioral change. So, so we really wanted an upper triangular formula in order to be able to talk about Fourier coefficients. And so if you go back to the formula here, there, everything looks really nice in upper triangular. We tried really, really hard to make it all upper triangular as we went through because we knew that we needed that. But you can't get rid of this. It's just here. And it really screws everything up a lot. So, I mean, you can make it up a triangular, and we did. Um, but it has 14 turns in the sum now. So, here's um, one of the pieces that you get when you look at the actual Fourier coefficients. So, this is, this is uh, so given a paramodular Z modular form of level one with Fourier expansion as above and a quadratic character, chi of p, so I'm only twisting in one place, I get a paramodular single modular form of level p to the fourth. So starting at level one, I'm going to assume that my conductor is one. Um, so we're going to get something of level p to the fourth. And this is going to be a piece of that Fourier expansion. So, so I have my Fourier expansion. I had you know, e to the 2 pi I trace of tz. Did stuff to z, and I was able to pull that all over here. So this is an action on a of t. These are just gas sums. Right? We're able to see what Fourier coefficients show up in terms of, so, so this is, I don't know if you're familiar with the Fourier expansion of legal modular forms, but these are positive definite matrices. And alpha, beta, beta, gamma. So they're representing quadratic forms, right? And so these turn out to be conditions on the quadratic forms. So there's only certain conditions on the quadratic forms where things can show up. Sometimes there's conditions on the determinant and so on. So I'm sort of hopeful that maybe some of these things will simplify if we think about it again. But this is one of the terms, and the thing is here, I know you can't combine them because you get different um, matrices acting on the t every time. So here I've got p to the minus 2, p squared. There's a couple times when I have, um, you know, p and or p to the n and 1. I mean, they don't. You can't combine them. They're, they're forced apart. So, so unfortunately for Brewer, we don't get a really pretty formula, but we have a formula. And I mean, it should be <coughs> So, anyway, that's all I have for today. Thanks. Questions for Jen? Uh, I, I was wondering if, I was curious if uh, the modularity conjecture of Romer and Kramer, if it has any flashy consequences uh, that are known, like something that follows, if that was true, some, some arithmetic no. geometry kind um, of. Uh, not that I am immediately aware of. I mean, Brewer and Kramer have a pretty good paper on it that I guess the last updated version is like from last year. And, uh, there's people computing examples um, for you and computed a bunch of examples and we've really kept that as well. Um, gosh, it's like what? Like, come on, what's the other? So I don't know. Does it give added a continuation for? Um, sure, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you get the, the L function is a, is a yeah. you know, automorphic L function. Because the L function like coincide. Get that, I mean, get that the, the Galois representations are also the same. Or they are one of
Okay, let's thank the speaker again.